Okay, well, we have a lot to cover today, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Morris Talk. I'm your host, Jennifer Farratt, Morris CEO. And today we have our guest, Ms. Colleen Keller Sterling. And I'll just tell you a little bit about her. She is an operations research analyst at Metron Incorporated, a DOD consulting firm specializing in mathematical software applications to real world problems. Colleen became involved in search analysis, starting with the search for missing aviator Steve Fawcett in 2006. She produced probability maps to guide search efforts for the Fawcett family and friends. And Colleen was subsequently part of the Metron team that performed probability mapping for the French government in the 2009 search for Air France 447. She was a Metron spokesperson for the MH370 searches in 2014, and she led the development and fielding of Metron's search and rescue smartphone development, uh, smartphone app, SAR app, which supports documentation and real-time situation awareness of field search operations, and is a founding member of the all-volunteer missing aircraft search teams, which tackles cold cases of missing aircraft. She is a 3,500 hour instrument and commercial rated private pilot and FAA certified AMP IA mechanic and a civilian volunteer to the San Diego Sheriff's Department Aero Unit. Colleen holds a BA in physics from Dartmouth College and an MS degree in applied physics from the Johns Hopkins University Whiting School of Engineering. She joined Metron in 1995 after an eight year career at the Center for Naval Analysis. Welcome Colleen. Thank you. Just wanna say also, um, so appreciative to Jack Keane, uh, one of our Morris Fellows for introducing us to you and, and uh, encouraging us to have you on Morris Talk. We're excited. Uh, I'm excited about today's conversation and we really appreciate the fact that you're willing to talk to us today. So thank you. I just want to, um, before we dive in, just remind everyone that if you do have questions to make sure you put them in the Q&A box instead of the chat box and we will try and answer them as we go along. Now we do have a lot to cover today and we have a lot of questions, but um, I know Colleen has been more than uh, willing, it sounds like, to answer any questions after. So make sure you put them in there and we'll get answers for you and post them on the website along with uh, the recording. So uh, why don't we start off with um, Colleen. I believe that some folks um, from our audience know you or have crossed paths with you at some point. And, but I guess for those of you, or for those that don't or haven't had that opportunity, do you mind giving us a little bit more information about your background and how you became to be an analyst and work on searching uh, for missing aircraft? Sure. So uh, I graduated with a degree in physics and really had no plan for how to use that degree, unfortunately. I wish I'd been more guided. Um, but luckily, I fell into the job at CNA and discovered a, a true passion for working with the Navy and more specifically doing field work for the Navy. I just loved working with the operating forces at sea or embedding. Um, and um, was very fortunate to be sent to field positions with CNA to work at Navy commands. Um, when I came to Metron, I, I again tried to work as much as I could out in the field, but it wasn't until maybe 10 or 15 years at Metron that I, I became very fortunate to combine my passion with aviation as a pilot with operations research um, in the search for Steve Fawcett. Um, Metron had a long history of, um, of uh, doing field search um, support using Bayesian search theory. Um, my, I'm standing on the shoulders of my predecessors at Metron um, in, in um, talking about this field. Um, but I watched the Steve Fawcett um, search unfolding just a couple hundred miles north of where I live in an area that I was very familiar with. And I just kept telling the principals at Metron, you know, we really need to become involved because this is a very disorganized search and I think we could help. And I kept being told, no, it's too messy. You don't want to do that. And eventually I did uh, get 
a, a foot in the door with the officials that had the data um, and did that search. And it, and it while we didn't find Fawcett, Fawcett was found by accident by a hiker. <laughs> Um, it, it opened a huge um, uh, door of opportunities for follow-on searches, uh, and and gave you know and 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 since then I've have had the fortune to do something that I am very passionate about, which is work on these searches, um, which it was just always a gift in your career, right? If you can work on something you're very passionate about. Absolutely, I agree. I mean that that is that's a wonderful thing to be passionate about something and it's it's your work, so that's great. Yeah. So um, we're, our conversation is really going to focus today on Bayesian searches, but for individuals like myself, <laughs> and I don't know if any others out there, can you please first explain to us what is meant by a Bayesian search? Yeah, um, Bayesian statistics applied to search theory is, um, is, is actually a very common sense approach. Um, the way it works is uh, you form what's called a prior distribution of where you think the target is. You grid up your search area, and then you come up with hypotheses for what, what happened to your target and where it might be located, and you weight each of those hypotheses. And you combine them all, and it gives you a, a probability map, a, a starting point for where you think the target is. Um, you quantify errors, um, and, and those help you form your probability distribution. Um, that's called the prior distribution. And then you allocate search effort. You have a certain number of sorties or you know, um, uh, sonar passes or something like that. You allocate your search effort to the highest probability cells. Um, and then you go out and search and you estimate your search effectiveness, which is often one of the most difficult things to do. Again, you're quantifying uncertainty there. After that first phase of search, you come back, you update the map with the negative search results. If you didn't find it, if you did, then you call it quits and go have a beer. Um, and then with the updated map, you um, plan your next uh, iteration of searching. So it's a very iterative process. Um, and the map is a common thread through that process that keeps you on track uh, and tells you where you should be looking next. And literally you just keep going until you're out of um, probability. If the target is, if you haven't found the target at the end of all that searching, you need to go back and look at your initial assumptions or think that maybe the target is outside your search area entirely. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. So the crash landing of Air France flight 447. I know that I'm sure many of the individuals are aware of this event and recall it. But can you refresh our memories a little bit and walk us through the circumstances of that flight? Yeah, it was uh, really shocking. This was a commercial flight, uh, Air, France, Air France flagged Airbus 320. Uh, oh, it was, it was an Airbus. I don't think it was a 320. I think it was a 319. I don't remember. It, it's now been about 15 years. Um, on a flight from Rio de Janeiro to uh, Paris, France, overnight flight, passing the equator, crossing the Atlantic, and they ran into bad weather in an area um, called the Intertropical Convergence Zone, which is right around the equator where you typically have a lot of thunderstorms in the summer. Uh, they had a handoff from Brazil to the controllers in Africa um, just past midnight. Um, no communications in this area. So literally they just did dead wreck in the track and they expect to pick them up in half an hour when they come back within comms range and they never called up. So. Uh, they eventually figured out that the airplane crashed. Um, they had really no information other than there was a last handshake with the, um, the aircraft has a communication system that's kind of used for more maintenance and logistics. It's called ACARS. It stands for Aircraft Communication Addressing and Reporting System. And it, it basically sends like, um, uh, wellness checks back to the maintenance people in a periodic fashion. It does not give position reporting typically, um, and certainly not at a, a regular rate that you could use for pinpointing like breadcrumb tracking of the aircraft. Right. Um, but um, they had an ACARS handshake at a certain time and then um, X minutes later they had another A. Uh, no, they were expecting one and they didn't get one. So they figured the aircraft went down somewhere in that time period. 
that gave them a last known point um, and a search area that was 40 nautical miles in radius. So that's pretty big when you're talking out in the middle of the Atlantic. Right. Um, they, they immediately started surface search efforts in the next uh, six days, but it took them five or six days to find the first floating wreckage. So, uh, you know, the trail had kind of gone cold because it's very difficult to take that wreckage and figure out where it might have come from. Mm -hmm. um, the search uh, went on for uh, two years. They didn't find the wreckage until April 2011. It took several iterations of search, um, but Metron was brought on and after the first 30 days when they realized they weren't gonna find it immediately and they needed help to organize the search. And we did a couple iterations of the probability map. Um, and in the final iteration, they found it right in the highest probability area. It was, a, it was pretty exhilarating to actually be associated with a find like that. I bet, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it was really an unfortunate accident. Um, you know, there were like a hundred plus people missing on this plane. And th th one of the major things was people's uh, faith in commercial air travel was shaken by this. They needed to know what happened. Um, people were really concerned. And it, it did turn out that there were a lot of findings as a result of the data that they collected from the flight data recorder and cockpit voice recorder that changed um, uh, procedures for training and instrumentation for commercial aircraft going forward. So it was a pretty monumental um, aviation accident. Yeah, wow. It is, it is very sad that, you know, those individuals lost their lives, but it's pretty amazing that, and, and I'm sure, like you said, very exciting to be part of that find. Yeah, actually what happened is the pilots stalled the aircraft when they lost um, primary instrumentation in the cockpit due to water getting in the pitot tubes. The computer had erroneous uh, conflicting information and it literally shut down and they were hand flying in the dark in, I mean, you know, in the clouds at night um, based on instrumentation, like we call it steam gauges in pilot speak, you know, not glass panels, but just round gauges giving altitude and airspeed and stuff like that. And as a primary, you know, uh, civilian pilot, we're taught to fly on reduced instrumentation when you lose, uh, you know, some of your <clears throat> inputs. And they didn't do that. They, they literally were so, you know, um, used to flying on glass and flying on speed tapes and the, the fancy instrumentation that when it came down to hand flying the airplane, they blew it. Okay. And I mean, the fact is they were up at very high altitudes. So there's kind of a, a wedge that you can fly in. It's called the coffin corner. If you fly too fast, then you, you get mock, um, mock uh, what's it called? Um, um, you, you get between these two air speeds. If you fly too slow, you can stall easily. And if you get too, if you get too fast, you get into mock buffet, which is also kind of a stall. So you, you have to fly very precisely, but they did some really basic things wrong. And so the training has changed now, now that we know what went wrong. Um, the simulator training is they practice this kind of thing in the simulators. Well, that's reassuring. <laughs> That they're yes. doing. That. It's safe to fly. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, you've given us a glimpse of, you know, your background and, um, you know, uh, what the circumstances around this flight, but can you pinpoint um, what sets you and Metron apart that made you all the clear choice for the French government on this search? What triggered that? Sure. Yeah. Well, we actually were recommended, highly recommended by a colleague in South Africa named Johan Strumpfer, who was familiar with Metron's history of conducting searches like this. So um, we, we owe a debt of gratitude to our colleague. Um, but Metron actually has a long history of doing this. It goes back to uh, prior to Metron, actually, the people that founded Metron um, Henry Richardson, Larry Stone, Tom Corwin, um, they worked on searches that were actually pretty famous in the history books now, applying Bayesian theory for some of the first times, um, building on, you know, Koopman's search theory from World War II. Um, Henry Richardson um, was a young Wagner Associates 
um, mathematician and uh, got sent to, um, let me see if I can say this right, it's Spain, Pal Palomares, Spain, where the uh, Air Force lost an H-bomb in the collision of a B-52 and a refueling tanker off the southeast coast of Spain. The aircraft was part of Operation Chrome Dome, which was continually flying H-bombs. And uh, the airplane went down in a big fire and three of the H-bombs went over land, but one went into the water and couldn't be found. And it was a huge political uproar and they needed to find this H-bomb or you know, say that they put in enough effort. And Richardson um, said, this is perfect application of Bayesian search theory. And we need to, you know, calculate. Um, actually, uh, I don't want to give all the credit to Henry because um, John Craven from the Navy's Office of Special Projects was the lead on this, and he recognized that he needed mathematicians to use the Bayesian search theory. So Craven was the the mastermind behind this, but Richardson was the guy with the calculator that was doing all the, you know, field work in calculating the probabilities and gridding the area. And together they put together these, you know, hypotheses of what might have happened. Did the bomb go down with the wreckage? Did it float in a parachute? Did the parachute get dragged underwater by currents? And they laid out a prior distribution probability map. And then they, unfortunately, they were unable to in real time calculate and update the map because they didn't have computers in 1966. So, but the best thing that the biggest, one of the biggest innovations that came out of that search was estimation of search um, effectiveness. Uh, that was a big deal to in real time be estimating how well you were searching. And um, Richardson observed that uh, chronically um, searchers overestimate their ability to search. And it's funny, I saw that in the faucet search, the Civil Air Patrol would come back from sorties and say, oh, we covered the area 100%, it's not there. You know, and that is just not true. And that's a real problem. So as analysts, we have to kind of bring people back to reality and try to give them a, a reality check and, and um, give them uh, you know, a more realistic search effectiveness. So Richardson did the um, H-bomb search. And then two years later, the Scorpion went missing. This was a submarine that the Navy uh, carrying, of course, nuclear torpedoes, mm -hmm. was supposed to be coming back to Virginia from the Med never made it back and the Navy now had a you know 2,000, 3,000 mile wide area that they had to figure out where the submarine was and was it shot by you know a Russian submarine this is during the Cold War. Again, lots of politics. And um, Henry Richardson and Craven were joined by Larry Stone, um, another new analyst out of Wagner Associates that um, you know went to sea, they generated a probability map, they had the benefit of um, soundings, um, triangulating soundings from Sonus, uh, SOSIS, uh, which was a new system back then, to um, which was which heard the implosion uh, sound of the submarine going below its crush depth, uh, narrowed the search area down. But in this search, they were able to, in real time, day by day, update the um, probability grid with the negative information of negative, you know, unsuccessful searches. And they narrowed it down, and um, it, it's really amazing. The scorpion was found a, a couple hundred yards away from one of the highest probability areas. So they really did a good job in narrowing down, focusing their search efforts. I think they found it in four or five months. Wow, it was a really big deal. So, yeah, yeah, big success there. So that's very impressive. Wow. So you know, there's a lot of history. Larry subsequently went on to apply Bayesian search theory to the um, search for the USS Central. I'm sorry, the the U, the Central America, which was an 1850s paddle uh, steam steamboat that was uh, bringing gold from California uh, to the East Coast from the gold strike, and it went down off the coast of North Carolina in a hurricane and crashed the stock market you know, and many, many lives were lost. And uh, that was um, a, a huge um, loss of, you know, a, a huge financial loss. Yeah. Uh, and in 1985, right after Larry came to Metron, a group hired Larry to build the probability maps. They were gonna find this thing. 
And it took them two years and lots of intrigue. And they did finally find it and started bringing up gold bars. It was a huge news item that subsequently became a great story because um, the person in charge of that ran off with all the money and the investors were shorted. <laughs> it seems like searches like this always end up like that. But um, so, but over and over, you know, the people that came before me at Metron kept showing how this really worked. And I think that it's, it's built a reputation throughout the years. Subsequent to that, the Coast Guard is now using Bayesian search in a simulation program that Metron developed the, you know, the inner workings for to find people missing at sea, drifting, you know, so now we have a moving target drifting at sea and they use this to allocate their search effort in the optimal fashion and it's been highly successful. So I think that long history at Metron was what led to that recommendation that got us the work for Air France. Okay, well, that makes sense. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about um, Bayesian statistics. Why are they uniquely uh, suited to guiding search efforts? Um, there's a couple things about Bayesian statistics that make it really uniquely qualified. Um, first of all, um, it, it accommodates uncertainty. So there's always uncertainty in searches. If you knew exactly where the target was, there wouldn't be a search. You'd just go straight to the search. Mm -hmm. So, you know, being able to quantify error and uncertainty and accommodate it in your probability map is one reason why it's, it's just, it, it, it works so well. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing about Bayesian statistics is that it um, incorporates all information, even conflicting information. Uh, a classic example of that is during the faucet search, we had a visual sighting of faucet flying over uh, some guy, a ranch hand's house. He said, I saw the aircraft, it went right over my house and went straight down that road. How can you, you know, turn that down? Well, it turns out he was wrong. <laughs> because Fawcett had crashed two hours before he said he saw the aircraft. I don't know what he saw, maybe he saw nothing, but boy, that just redirected the whole search into the desert of Nevada instead of the mountains of California where Fawcett was actually found. That sighting directly conflicted in timing with a radar track that we had that we also believed was Fawcett's airplane. And it, it was very um, disturbing that you had these two pieces of information that were so convincing and yet they, you know, it was either one or the other, it wasn't both. But Larry kept, Larry Stone, who I was working with, kept cautioning me that Bayesian statistics says you need to keep both those pieces of information and weight them to your, you know, which one you think is, they could be equally credible and then keep them in your analysis. You don't throw anything away. You, um, you allow for anything to be possible. And so the underlying probability map just combines all this conflicting information. Um, other approaches wouldn't do that. They would like stick with one or the other. Um, the other thing about Bayes is that uh, the, the central theorem of Bayes is that you're updating the information constantly as you're getting new information, as your, um, you know, your, uh, how you measure things, your, your perception of reality keeps changing as you collect more information. And there's like this methodolo methodological way of incorporating that into your underlying probability distribution function, incorporating feedback. That's a principle of Bayes. Um, the nicest thing about Bayes though, is that inevitably in these searches, you have to convince the people that hired you or the operators or the searchers that your way is better than their way. And Bayes makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's kind of how we search for something. Let's say you're missing your car keys in your house. You would first you know, say, well, I'm gonna go look where I usually put them, or maybe I put them where I first came in, or maybe they're still in the car. You have a couple of hypotheses and you go check those places first. And when it's not there, you don't go back and look there again. You look someplace new. But eventually, if you don't find them, you might go back and look in those original places because maybe you overlooked them. You know, it, it kind of makes sense. So it's, it's made it easier for us to convince the operators that this is the way to go and they should, you know, believe us and, and we should help be helping guide their search. Because a lot of times, I'll tell you, in, search, in searching, there are egos 
people know how to do it and they don't want some scientists to tell them how to do it. You know, this is so classic in fields in field work, right? In, in the Navy or elsewhere. Um, and there are egos aplenty in search theory. So um, uh, surmounting that is very, very challenging. Okay. Well, so we have two questions from the audience that I feel like ties into what we're talking about right now. One of those is from David Redpath and his question is, is how would this process of Bayesian uh, search methods be modified if the target of a search was possibly moving, like a drifting boat or a move, uh, survivor, a moving survivor in the area? Right. So the, the first question. Um, and then uh, I'll let you go ahead and answer that. And then I'll ask you the, the next one. So the Coast Guard has perfected that. Um, the Coast Guard is typically searching for somebody uh, in a boat that's drifting, you know, not under power or uh, somebody who's fallen overboard, right? There have been a, a lot of very fascinating searches that the Coast Guard did uh, for people that got swept off a ship, a, a fishing boat or fell off a cruise ship and they found them three days later. And the way that you do it is you, you, uh, you let the underlying target move instead of being stationary. Stationary is actually pretty easy. Once the target sticks or you know, sticks to the ground, basically, uh, it's not going anywhere. And so your, your probability map is static. But with a moving target, you need to update the target position um, in, in certain uh, hourly increments. And the Coast Guard does that by incorporating um, real-time information of winds and currents and calculating the leeway of the target. If it's a boat, it has different leeway than a person in the water. They've done a lot of studies to see how the person in the water will drift. And so they keep moving that, that um, a prior distribution. Well, I'm sorry, it, it, it starts as the prior distribution, but then as you incorporate search information it becomes your posterior, which forms the next prior for the next iteration of search. So you, you take these time frames and you just update your map and, and drift the target ahead. Um, and Larry Stone wrote a seminal book um, right after the Scorpion search uh, called The Theory of Optimal Search, which won the Lanchester Prize in 1975 for um, best work in operations research. And he more recently wrote um, a follow-on book about um, searching for moving targets in which he talks about all the underlying math. But the principle is to just keep updating that prior and let that target move with um, currents or winds or whatever. Okay, okay, interesting. So the next question um, is also about Bayesian search and uh, Bob uh, Henson has a question about, it took uh, 13 months to accidentally find Steve Fawcett, but did the Bayesian search get close to the actual location where he was found by the hiker? Unfortunately, it did not. And, and the reason is we had such a high credibility visual sighting in the desert that everybody focused on the desert. And this was a, a true lesson learned for me. And actually after the Steve Fawcett search, I, I kind of did what any analyst would do. I wrote up a lessons learned brief. This is where we went wrong. This is what we could do better. And went out on the road and tried to approach the land search community, you know, briefing at NASAR and uh, I went to Moore's, which is not land search, but I, I went to the Civil Air Patrol and wow, I mean, some people were receptive, but some people were not receptive. I told you there's a lot of egos in this community. And, um, you know, what, what happened is they had, it's so fascinating, they had a radar track that was Steve Fawcett's aircraft flying where Steve said he would be flying south along the Sierra Nevada crest at the speeds that his airplane should be flying. And they started to investigate it, um, but it was in terrain that was difficult to search. So we, they always tend to shy away if it's hard to search, they search the easy places first, which kind of makes sense. You know, I mean, I understand that, but that's kind of denying the, um, the prior that you started with. They, they should have spent more time searching where that track ended, but instead the visual sighting came in and everybody's attention just like immediately, they're just like kids, you know, going for the bright, shiny thing. They, they went to the desert, they never went back. And I think if they had been using the Bayesian approach, they would have had um, a more continuous thread, uh, like a documentation 
of, oh yeah, that's right. We were gonna search this area, but we got distracted. We need to go back here because there's high probability here because we had a very likely radar track there. And instead they just weren't keeping track of how well they were doing, where the sectors were being searched. They were overestimating their search effectiveness and they never went back and searched that area. And in retrospect, when the Yosemite search and rescue community sent a helicopter over to investigate the, the belongings that this hiker found, the hiker found $100 bills and Fawcett's pilot's license <laughs> scattered. And uh, we, we think an animal got into his remains and, and scattered, chewed on his wallet or something. It got, it got scattered. It was a quarter mile away from the actual wreck site. And he just stumbled upon this. And then he got back to Mammoth Lakes and he's like, hey, I found this pilot's license and a hundred dollar bills. What do you think it was? And people are like, you idiot, that's Steve Boss. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. It was great. Um, and the, the wreck was actually visible from the air, from a helicopter. They started doing expanding cir circle searches and they found it within an hour or two on a hillside smeared up the hillside, evidence of a fire, bright orange in tires and engine. I've, I've hiked up there, I've seen it. And they, they, it should have been visible from the air, but it was very difficult to search because it's at over 10,000 feet and aircraft don't have very good performance. And it's very squirrely in the Sierras, you know, so, but if they had searched that area effectively, they probably would have found it. So it's very unfortunate that we didn't spend more time on that sector and that we were distracted by that visual sighting. Lesson learned. Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> so um, I'm hoping this answers one or two of the audience's questions too. That our next question is, what is the different types of data your team used in, in search analysis? And then maybe um, one of our audience members asked too, if you could tack on to this, if you can please describe the tools that you use to implement your search algorithms. Sure, sure. The data is really varied, um, and it depends on if you're over land or over water. Um, radar is a great tool if you can get the tracks, and the Civil Air Patrol now has a mechanism to immediately dump the radar data and to identify most likely tracks. They filter it by speeds and altitudes and things like that, depending on what you're looking for. Um, the other thing that the Civil Air Patrol is using now is cell phone forensics. They, if the pilot has a cell phone that's operating, they can pull the data almost immediately. They have agreements with them, you know, for privacy, they can anonymize it, but they have agreements with the cell phone providers to pull um, which towers registered with that specific phone number. And they can triangulate to a pretty tight area, which is super nice. I mean, we didn't have that during Fawcett and Fawcett wasn't carrying a cell phone and there were no cell phone sites in the Sierras. But nowadays they can be very quick to find or to narrow down the search area. Um, aircraft carry emergency locator transmitters, which uh, emit on impact, they emit a certain frequency like a distress signal. And you can um, use that information if it's available, but a lot of times the ELT is damaged or destroyed in the accident or the antenna is broken and it doesn't work. Um, for the Air France search, one of the major phases of the search was um, searching for the, the pinger sound, the underwater beacon attached to the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder. Um, and that uh, they, you know, those signals last for a month before the battery dies and you can tow a pinger locator and, and it'll localize where the wreckage is. Neither MH370 nor Air France emitted a viable beacon. In both those accidents, either they were looking in the wrong place for MH370, or in the case of Air France, neither of the pingers was working. And they spent a whole month, the initial month, looking for the pinger signal for Air France and gave up and started switching to um, side scan sonar and underwater video from AUVs. Um, and uh, and they credited, the problem with the Air France search was they credited the pinger locator search that they spent the whole month on with very high probability of detection. And so it blacked out those areas and said we needed to search elsewhere. And then they spent the next year searching other sectors of that 40 mile circle. When in reality, 
the pingers weren't ever operating and the wreckage was there the entire time and they passed right over it listening for this signal. Mm -hmm. And so one of the questions you know, people have is, well, what was the breakthrough that finally led to the, uh, the probability map that pinpointed the location of the Air France wreckage? The breakthrough was when we stepped back and said, wow, we've, we've searched a lot here and we're not finding it. I wonder if we should generate a map with those pinger beacons not working at all which invalidates that whole pinger search mm -hmm. and sends us back to the near the center of the uncertainty area and start all over again. Should we maybe search there? And that was what refocused the search effort back to the center of the probability uh, map. And, and they found the wreckage within a week. Wow. So, you know, sometimes you got to be really careful about the data that you're using. Was there a signal to begin with? And in that case, there wasn't. Um, uh, just briefly, other types of data, gee, in the, in the faucet search, we, we, we spent a lot of time trying to quantify the effectiveness of the search effort. So we use records from the Civil Air Patrol and from the private search effort generated by the friends of Steve Fawcett, which equaled the government's search effort. It was amazing how many sorties were flown. Uh, over uh, 1,700 sorties, I'm sorry, 1,000 sorties, 1,700 flight hours were um, spent in a 30 day period over like $1.4 million the government spent looking for Steve Fawcett. It was almost like an embarrassment near the end. They were like, we gotta keep looking. You know, it, it well exceeded what they would normally do because they kept thinking he's gotta be there somewhere. Um, so if evaluating how effective a given sortie was as it passed over an area, we used um, how high the sortie flew, how many observers were on the aircraft, the speed the aircraft flew at, uh, and the terrain it was flying over. And we actually made a computer program that calculated using the random search formula, because that was the best we could do. So assuming the searchers were looking out either side and sweeping a lateral area, we used a computer that credited each sortie um, with um, a, a coverage factor, you know, a probability of detection in the sectors that um, we searched. So we definitely used computers for the faucet search. Um, we also looked at the whole search area and characterized the terrain um, computationally into um, vegetated, um, sparse, and desert so that we could, and mountainous. We actually also factored in the mountains because shadows make it difficult to see targets. You can imagine over land is very difficult to search. Uh, over water or in the water is also difficult because the acoustic you know, environment and the bottom contours make it very difficult to search as well. We use the bathymetry. We use the acoustic properties of the water to estimate sonar effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Knowing something about sonars really helps us in, in effective, you know, calculating the effectiveness. In the Air France search, we got very lucky because the wreckage was on a nice, clean, sandy, flat area. Unbelievably. And I have a feeling the wreckage for MH370 is in something equivalent to, you know, the Rockies. Not clean, you know, down in a crevasse. Or, I mean, it, it could easily be in an area that a side scan sonar would just pass over and not recognize wreckage from boulders or rocks. Right. Well, I mean, these all sound like they're huge undertakings. Um, you know, which is, it, these searches are just massive. And you're, you've been talking a lot about, um, you know, uh, outside issues that you were dealing with or even people that were helping. So is there any other kind of outside forces that you were dealing with that, you know, you might want to mention or any, any political, um, maybe outside influences that you were dealing with during these searches in particular, maybe the, the uh, flight, the Air France flight? Yeah, the air fret, I mean, it's easy to talk about faucet, but we weren't an official hired uh, entity in the faucet search. We were working with the friends of faucet um, as volunteers, but in, in the air France search, there were a lot of politics. We were definitely working uh, for the um, French, it's basically the French NTSB called the Bureau of Inquiries and Analysis. I think it was, that's what it was, BEA, it was in French. And, um, and they, they did not want um, any assumptions in the search that would tend to point to um, somebody being guilty of causing the accident. So they did not want us to make any assumptions that the aircraft stalled 
because that would make the pilots look bad. Or they did not want us to say, you know, let's, one of the assumptions could be maybe one of the engines failed or there was an equipment failure because that would make Airbus look bad. You know, so we had to kind of be very generic in our assumptions. And when we put together our prior distribution, the prior, it was very interesting. It was, um, they were very fussy about what went into the prior. So it was a, basically a 30, 30, 30 split of three different things, uh, three different inputs. One was a uniform distribution of probability over the entire 40 nautical mile radius circle which put most of the probability in the center and then gradually out. So that basically was saying right after their last distress, they hit distress and uh, they had all these problems. They probably went down within minutes of that. The other thing was they wanted us to look at um, historical loss of control accidents because they suspected it was a loss of control accident in the weather with the bad inputs, which it was. Um, so they looked at uh, a, a subset of accidents that happened where the pilots lost control in bad weather, and they looked at how far away from the initiation of the loss of control did the aircraft actually crash. And we, we did a circular normal distribution based on that data, and that turned out to be quite reasonable. I think it was within eight miles of the loss of control that, that the aircraft crashed. And then finally, the most controversial was the, the last input was we picked up all this floating wreckage. And in particular, we picked up bodies or parts of bodies. And the Coast Guard knows how bodies drift. So they liked to use that because they understand the leeway of a body floating in the water. I know it sounds gruesome, but you know uh, uh, the, the big picture on the news was the big vertical fin that was intact, that was pulled out of the water. And you have no way of knowing what the wind was doing to that and how well it would drift. But a body, they knew how that drifted. So I, I got this wonderful Excel file talking about all these bodies that they picked up and when they found them and where they found them. And everybody wanted, it was so tempting to reverse drift those bodies back to where they came from, right? Given winds and currents. The problem is we don't know what the winds and currents were in this area. Now the French had a model, the Brazilians had a model, and the US Navy had a model. And when they reverse drifted all these bodies back, all the models had completely different areas where <laughs> these things came from. It was amazing. And a year later, after the accident, they dropped a pattern of buoys in the water to map the currents and the winds at the same time of the year, thinking, oh, we'll get control data, this will be good. Those buoys, went in circles like a washing machine. I mean, it just, this, this was a very um, unstable area in the ocean. So in retrospect, we realized, and then where the aircraft actually crashed had nothing to do with where the current models said, you know, those, the, the parts came from. It was really impressive. But at the time that we were doing this search, everybody thought, wow, this is data. We just have to use this data. You know, let's do a reverse drift analysis. So 30% of our prior was based on the Navy's reverse drift analysis. We actually championed the Navy. We felt that the Navy's model was the best and it turns out it wasn't. So we came up with this prior um, based on these, but the BEA was very forceful that we needed to use the, this kind of data and we could not make any assumptions. Um, they were worried about lawsuits. They were worried about the public scrutiny that they were doing this the right way, you know, the, the victim's families were, why can't you find this thing? You know, there was a lot of pressure on them, the press. And then, as I said, egos often come into this, you know, people want to use their data, they want to do it their way. And in the middle of this, you're just trying to do good analysis. So it, it was a very stressful time. I'm sure that it was. So, I mean, I, I think you mentioned this a little while ago, but can you describe maybe a little bit more about the breakthrough moment that led to the discovery of the wreckage and, and you know, maybe expand on that a little bit? Yeah, we had generated our first probability map by the end of the summer, maybe three months after uh, the aircraft went down. And they searched on that for the, the next iteration. They, they conducted their sonar searches. And, and then this drift group um, of experts about reverse drifting these bodies. You know, they kind of got control and they dictated, hey, we need to be searching in this area or this area. And, and Metron kind of 
the, the Bayesian stuff kind of went out the window. You know, we, we still updated the map, but they weren't using the map to search. They were searching in areas that they thought were important. Mm -hmm. Then after a year of not finding anything, um, the BEA came back to us and said, you know, we're gonna go out in the spring again. It was about 18 months later. We'd like you to update the map one more time. And Larry sat down with the team and said, okay, they've done a lot of searching here and something's not right. And maybe we need to generate two maps. And actually, I, can I show this slide with, um, yeah, I'm gonna take control of the screen. Maybe we should generate two maps. Oops, and I have the wrong, the wrong one. I want, oh, here we go. Um, I want slide 28 and 29. Maybe we should show two maps. What, this is what the probability distribution um, looked like. It was in a circle. The center is obviously the hottest point. And these big blue areas here are where they, 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 they search the crap out of the bottom of the ocean with sonar, side scan sonar and unmanned vehicles. And then these blue areas down here were some early on side scan sonar searching. The aircraft was headed in a northeasterly direction. So they searched a lot along the route that the aircraft was supposed to be traveling. Mm -hmm. Um, red means more likely and green means less likely, and blue means less likely. So we actually gave them two maps. One was the posterior, assuming that the beacons were working. So all of this area in here had been searched by the beacon search early on, and it was a low probability area. And then Larry said, you know, I'm really uncomfortable with this. Maybe we should generate two maps. And the second map should say, both beacons failed, which was a low probability, but let's just give them a map that said there were no beacons, that beacon search was ineffective, and it, it pointed to a very warm area here. And they chose to search right off of the last known point in the direction of flight, and it was found right where my cursor is. And it was really amazing. The, um, the beacons, we did account for the beacons possibly, um, and this was, the area where it was actually found. You can see this is a very flat area. We got so lucky um, in finding it there because the, the wreckage just completely stood out. Um, it, it just, you could see it. This is what the side scan sonar looked like from the Remus. And this is the engine and part of the landing gear that they found. And these were the, um, the data recorders in the grasp of the, um, of the mechanical arm of the recovery unit. Both of them were recovered and the data was um, completely recovered off of them, it was really amazing. Um, but you know, we did consider um, that the beacons broke. Um, we, we, we did probabilities of one or more beacons surviving. We did independent probabilities that they survived and then dependent probabilities. And we actually did a weighted average of independent and dependent probabilities and came up with a likelihood of 77% that the beacon survived and the actual answer was zero. So, you know, so we kind of broke with the Bayesian methodology by saying, let's generate that second map. But at that point we had searched so much, we really felt that it was warranted. And that's what led to the breakthrough for the search. Okay, okay, great. Well, so this leads us all to um, still the unsolved Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 search, okay? And I guess my question is to you, are you working on this? And do you believe you could leverage your success with the Air France search to employ a similar approach to the Malaysian airline flight recovery? So, you know, we watched the Malaysian air um, search unfold and we really wanted to become involved. This is pretty much the search of our lifetime and we were poised to do this, right? Um, the Australian Transportation Safety Board, the ATSB, headed the search after the Indonesians gave it to them because they couldn't, you know, couldn't possibly take it. And it was near Australia. And we have to say, ATSB did a wonderful job. They did use Bayesian techniques in the search to guide the search. Um, so we can't be critical of them, but we, we did continually try to like add value to the search. We actually wrote a paper about um, using um, forward drift um, using the SARops approach, uh, the um, search and the, the tool that the Coast Guard uses, using that approach to try to help them um, locate where the wreck, because wreckage turned up in Africa a year later, you might recall, 
And it is kind of difficult to reverse drift wreckage across the Indian Ocean over the course of a year. That's a little bit uncertain. But we, we, we wrote a paper trying to um, help guide their search. And we had some ideas for how we could narrow down the search area by incorporating aerodynamic uh, modeling um, and, um, and, and some other things, just incorporating some uh, Monte Carlo modeling that would kind of pinpoint where they had these big swaths based on um, Inmarsat um, analysis with registration between the aircraft and the Inmarsat satellite. And uh, th they were very large search areas. Um, and we thought we could narrow it down a little bit. And we, we tried to become involved, but we actually were never hired to work on that search. So unless uh, somebody comes up with a new lead, we're, we're where we are and, and it's, it's kind of a cold case at this point. Okay. All right, so what other searches have you supported and have you worked on any other uh, missing aircraft searches during your career? Yeah, so um, after the Fawcett search, I became, uh, I was a founding member of the missing aircraft search team, which is the experts from the Fawcett search decided we needed to kind of keep this ball rolling because we had a lot of expertise. Um, the first search we took on was a search for a small aircraft missing for over a year in Arizona near Sedona. And after a full year of, of working on the search and using the Bayesian modeling, we came up with um, two likely areas and in preparations to go in on the ground to look for this aircraft, we found um, a record of a fire reported in that area on the day the aircraft went missing. And um, when people went in to look at the origin of the fire, they found the wreckage. So it, that was, uh, that was, and that news broke worldwide. That was really exciting because I had worked directly with the father of the woman that went missing in the aircraft, the father and mother, uh, they're still personal friends. And I just can't tell you, it means so much to be able to bring closure to a family to at least find what happened and to, because, you know, it's just really sad. It's tough to not know what happened for the victim. Yeah. Um, subsequent to that, we, we did another search looking for a missing P-51 flown by um, the last missing WASP of World War II that went into the ocean off of Los Angeles, we believe. Um, we were doing um, diving on areas that um, I identified based on analysis um, and, and based on bathymetry data we had in the area that showed objects on the bottom that could potentially be the P-51. That was more field work. That was a lot of fun and a lot of updating maps. We did not find the P-51. It's a challenging problem, 40-year-old problem. Um, most recently, Larry Stone and I worked on uh, generating probability maps for the um, for missing uh, TBM Avengers from World War II, missing in the Bermuda Triangle off the coast of Florida for a National Geographic special. Um, and we, we think most likely the aircraft um, all went the wrong direction and got lost at sea, but we you know, looked at all the historical data and narrowed it down. So it, it's just been a huge variety of things. I could name so many searches, but these searches keep coming and people come to us and ask us to kind of help narrow down their search using these techniques. Well, that's wonderful. And it's a wonderful service you're providing to people. I'm sure they're very appreciative and, and appreciate you know, having that closure and knowing when, when uh, a loved one's missing, like you mentioned. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of questions that uh, the audience has asked, and I tried to incorporate a few of them, but I, I know I haven't been able to get to all of them. Uh, and we're getting close to the closeout. I'll ask one more question from the audience, but I just want to remind everyone again that we will, um, we will be sending the questions that haven't been answered to Colleen and she's willing to answer those and we'll post them on the website um, with this recorded talk. But one of the last questions I'll close out with um, before we close our session is, have your methods changed in light of recent developments in machine learning? And that's from Matthew Goldberg. Oh, um, I I can't really point to any changes, but I wasn't the technical person that was doing the computer simulation part. So we had a team. I was the person collecting the field information and, and adding the expertise um, from my aviation background. 
and Larry was the Larry Stone was the overall you know expert talking and directing the analysis and which way it should go in and making the statistical assumptions. And then we typically had somebody who was on the computer that was doing the Monte Carlo simulation to come up with the uh, the probability maps. So um, I am probably not the person to ask, but I can't think of anything where machine learning ha we have used machine learning to date. And actually, we'd be very interested to hear if somebody has an idea for how that could be incorporated. Okay, great. Well, thank you for answering that. Um, so let me just see here. Uh, there is uh, another question here. Uh, let me see here. I that I want to pull. Um, uh, Amelia Earhart, what is your opinion on that one? <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, there's an ongoing search um, of the South Pacific Islands looking for Amelia. And I've actually talked to, um, um, I think Ryan Gillespie is the person um, directing the search. There's, um, it's called TIGAR, T-I-G-H-A-R is the organization that's doing that. Mm -hmm. um, that is a big search area. <laughs> and it's, you know, the fact that it's uh, such a large area and so long ago means that whatever wreckage is there underwater is probably pretty corroded and maybe difficult, you know, covered with um, sea life and maybe very difficult to find. Uh, and it is such a remote area. I mean, all these things are the reason why we haven't found MH370 or, or Amelia Earhart. And you know everybody should uh, seems to think that you know being a female aviator, I should be very passionate about this. And my feeling is I would rather spend you know my efforts helping people whose loss is fresh, you know, a family who's grieving, uh, you know, or, or there's still something missing, or it could make a significant improvement in knowledge, understanding why the aircraft went down. The Amelia Earhart thing is very romanticized, um, but it's so long ago. I think we may never find you know, evidence of where she uh, went, went down, unfortunately. Okay, well, thank Sorry. you. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. Well, you know, I, I, we are wind, uh, wound down to our, uh, the end of our time here with you. And I can't thank you enough for uh, coming on to Moore's talk and spending an hour with us. There's, a, like I said, a lot of questions and I apologize to everyone for not being able to get them all in. Uh, but we thank everyone for joining us. Again, want to thank Jackine for making that connection. And do you have anything you want to, uh, any parting words you want to share with everyone? You know, I, I just wanted to say that I never would have envisioned that I could be working on something um, so targeted to my talents and, and something that was so fulfilling for me. I, you know, but that's the beauty of operations research. And the beauty of having a great mentor like Larry Stone that recognized what I could offer and how there was a synergy between what Metron had to offer and what I could do, we would never have gotten involved with the faucet search, which led to so many things. Mm -hmm. If I hadn't pushed and Larry hadn't been willing to um, work with me on that. And I just think that operations research has so many different ways that you can apply the principles and solve problems. And that's what I love most about this career. And it's been very rewarding. Well, that's terrific. Again, thank you so much. And everyone, please join us um, again for Moore's Talk. Now, I think you all, I hope you all remember that we are gonna start going to every other week uh, starting this month. So our next talk isn't going to be until Friday, the 21st of May. I hope to all see you back then. Thank you and have a great weekend.